great. Yeah, that was a great discussion. I want to thank both Neha and Jasleen for two outstanding talks this morning. Um, and thank you to Matt for inviting me to present today at Nephrology Grand Rounds. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, cardio-nephrology subspecialty care models. Um, some of you may have heard parts of this in different forums, but I thought this would be a good opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing on the Montlake campus with our colleagues at other sites. So why subspecialty care models in nephrology? And so um, I think from the, as we've seen from this actually last talk, um, in the talk previous to that, the interface between nephrology and other fields of medicine continues to expand. Um, and we've seen this through this kind of explosion of multi cross-disciplinary therapies, diagnostics, and therapeutics, which really um, drive the cross-disciplinary collaboration. And from that, um, as we have these multimorbid patients, there's been a need for unique expertise. And this expertise may not actually be obtained by training in individual subspecialties alone. And for our field, it's been seen as an opportunity to um, innovate nephrology. And this is not new to UW nephrology. And, um, you know, I was actually, when I came to UW in 2013, I was really impressed. UW was ahead of the curve in terms of thinking about subspecialty care models. Um, and this is some of the subspecialty care models we currently have. And it's a, it's a really impressive and comprehensive list. And so knowing that we have all these subspecialty care models already, why was there a need to add yet one more? Why cardionephrology? And so we know that cardiovascular disease and kidney disease commonly co-occur in hospitalized and ambulatory patients. And in particular, if you think about hospitalized patients, um, acute kidney injury um, is incredibly common in patients with acute heart failure, post myocardial infarction, or undergoing cardiothoracic surgery. Um, based on the literature, we've seen that rates of AKI range from 30 to 50% in these patients. Um, AKI is associated with poor short-term outcomes, including higher risk of in-hospital mortality, um, are more likely to be associated with an ICU stay, longer length of stay, and more likely to be um, associated with 30-day readmissions. We've also seen AKI linked with poor long-term outcomes as well, including progression of progressive loss of kidney function to CKD and an end-stage kidney disease, development of subsequent cardiovascular disease, as well as hypertension. Um, and because of this, um, AKI as a hospitalization um, is a high risk, um, requires high resources. So knowing this, we dove into the UW data a little bit more to see what was happening on the Montlake campus, because um, there is such a high cardiovascular population on that campus. And what we saw was that in 2019, if we just looked at the patients who were admitted with a primary diagnosis of heart failure, 65% um, actually um, developed AKI during the hospitalization, so really high. And um, actually UW is the busiest mechanical circulatory support center on the West Coast, meaning we do the most number of impellas, balloon pumps, LVADs, and other cardiac devices. And so this is a very specialized population that's usually quite sick. So we went back at, at the data, looked at over three years, and we found that amongst these patients who were receiving temporary mechanical circulatory support devices, 42% of them required acute hemodialysis during their hospitalization. We looked, um, we then looked a little bit more granularly um, and we compared um, those patients who had heart failure, who had a diagnosis of AKI, to those with heart failure without, an, without AKI, and we compared the length of stay, their death rate, and their 30-day readmission rate. And what you can see here is that those patients who, who were admitted to Montlake with heart failure who had AKI had an average length of stay that was three times longer than those who did not have AKI, their death rate was four times higher, and they were more likely to be readmitted within 30 days. And so our data really um, aligned with the national data. And so we saw this as a huge need to possibly improve outcomes in this population. 
And so what were some of the barriers that we hoped to overcome with launching of this new service? So, you know, we saw that there were several barriers. One, um, as a lot of service, you know, there's often less standardized approaches to care, particularly with attendings that are revolving every one or two weeks. Uh, you know, this growing population of these patients um, who have cardiovascular disease and kidney disease while hospitalized um, was increasingly complex with these cardiac devices and other therapies and may require a specialized skill set to care for them. In this group of patients, we found that the inpatient to outpatient transitions were particularly challenging. They were frequently bouncing back and forth between the two settings and we needed smoother transitions. And finally, I think it's been um, pretty well known that communication, particularly amongst between cardiologists and nephrologists can often be disjointed um, and not and, and there's room for improvement. And in fact, you know, kind of the disagreements between cardiologists and nephrologists have um, been long recognized. I've shown this article before, but this is actually a real news story in Michigan where a cardiologist and a nephrologist got in a physical alteration um, because of a disagreement about diuretics, that, which led to the arrest of one of the physicians. Um, you know, fortunately that didn't happen at UW, but uh, you know, we wanna avoid that with creating, by creating better communication. And uh, in fact, you know, this has become the source of a parody. Um, some of you guys might have heard of this ophthalmologist. His name is Dr. Glockenflecken, he goes by. It's a social media kind of star where he does all these um, satires about different things in medicine that are really funny. Um, but he's created an entire series devoted to what he's calling cardiology versus nephrology and little clips of all the disagreements and fights that that the two subspecialties have. So clearly there's room to improve communication between our specialties. And so because of this, there's really been a, um, a national call to action to create cardio nephrology services. This is a paper that came out from an international Spanish society. There was a piece by one of the former presidents of the American Society of Nephrology, um, Dr. Agarwal, who mentioned this as well, nephrocardiology as a way forward. Um, a recent perspective was published in CJSON advocating for the use of these models. Um, and then here's one in KI, and then people have, um, have suggested nephrocardiology as a way to um, improve nephrology training as well. And so with this in mind, um, under the vision and leadership of Stuart and Ashley, um, Nay and David and I launched the Kidney Heart Service at the UW Montlake campus in August of 2020. And our mission was fourfold. Our clinical mission was to provide exceptional, coordinated, multidisciplinary care for patients hospitalized with concomitant heart and kidney disease to improve patient outcomes and as, as well as optimize resource allocation. We hope to develop innovative bedside tools that could improve clinical care. Um, we aim to provide educational opportunities for training in specialized care of kidney and heart disease. And finally, to build a foundation um, from a research perspective, we hope to build a foundation for scholarly endeavors, including QI as well as research. And so what does this look like? So, um, the way the service works is that it's um, staffed by primarily David and Nan and, and then myself, uh, and we consult on patients who have a who are uh, on a primary cardiology or cardiothoracic surgery service, and we see both floor and ICU patients. We've developed because it's a small group of attendings. We've really developed streamlined communication models with all the um, services that we're consulting on. Um, we talk frequently and we've developed hopefully a greater consistency in our approach. And one thing that's really come out of this, which has been fun, is that there's been a lot of trust that's been built between um, cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery and ourselves and has led to a lot of bi-directional learning, which has been very fruitful. And so now I wanted to share some of the one year outcomes that we've had um, for this service. So to start with the clinical outcomes, so in the first, um, you know, mind you, we did launch during COVID, so keep that in mind when looking at some of these, um, some of this data. But in the first year, 
Um, so on the UW Montlake campus, about 44% um, of patients had AKI overall. Um, amongst those who had um, heart failure and um, heart failure and who were in the ICU, either the CCU or the CTICU, 82% um, had AKI. Um, in our first months since of our launching, we were seeing about a quarter of all patients who were hospitalized with a diagnosis of heart failure, and we were seeing 60% of all the CCU and CTICU patients. So we were quick to pick up um, to gain popularity, I would say. So this is the data that I previously showed you looking at um, how, what were the outcomes associated with AKI in terms of length of stay, death rate, and readmission rate. And to remind you, we prior to the launch of kidney heart service, we saw that a significantly higher length of stay, death rate, and readmission rate in those with AKI and heart failure. So now I want to show you some data that we have post um, launch of the kidney heart service. So if you focus the um, first three rows are looking at heart failure patients with AKI one year pre kidney heart service compared with one year post kidney heart service. So you can see the number of um, patients we're looking at is relatively uh, or is fairly close in number. Um, in the one year post kidney heart service, we saw that patients who had AKI and heart failure on average had about a three day reduction in length of stay. There was a slight increase in death rate, which we can't explain. It could be related to COVID. We did, did see a small decrease in the percentage of patients requiring acute inpatient dialysis. Um, and despite a reduction in length of stay, we did not see an increase in readmission rate, which is always the concern, which was reassuring. Um, you know, and we can't say for certain that this is all due to KHS. There's a lot going on there, and this is clearly descriptive data. Um, but if you look at those patients without AKI and heart failure, you can see that the length of stay death rate and readmission rate stayed about the same. So we, although preliminary, um, I think these data are encouraging that the service may be, contrib may be a good thing, and I think we'll continue to follow these data. So what are some other things that we've done on the kidney heart service in the first year? So we've introduced point of care ultrasound or POCUS um, to the service where the attendings were trained via a simulator as well as underwent hands-on training. And so this has become a routine part of our practice. We've also developed a diuretic protocol to um, have more standardized approaches to care in collaboration with cardiology. And the diuretic protocol has four um, guiding principles. One, it provides guidance on the starting doses of loop diuretics and how best to titrate. It attempts to apply objective measures to assess diuretic response, including spot urine, sodiums, weights, as well as eyes and O's. It gives direction on when and how to utilize adjunctive therapies and also um, introduces novel diagnostics and therapeutics to our service. And so here I'll walk briefly through the diuretic protocol, but if you're interested in receiving a copy of this, we're happy to send it to you. Um, so step one, it, it aims to identify the initial dose of the loop diuretic, and this is based on the patient's outpatient dose and we multiply it times 2.5 fold to um, come up with the inpatient IV dose, which can be either given as a bolus, as boluses or a continuous drip. And we have some stipulations in here based on um, EGFR as well as albumin, which may prompt earlier bumetanide use. Step two really focuses on diuretic response. And so what we are doing is in the first few hours of receiving the dose, we're checking spot urine sodiums and we're aiming for at least um, a urine sodium of greater than 50, ideally even 70, um, to, uh, to assess adequate response. We're also looking at weight changes, I's and O's and creatinines. And, what, and one other point about that, you know, we are doing this fairly frequently throughout the day, so we're not waiting for 24 hour I's and O's. We're making more interim changes more quickly, and I think which has been helpful. 
And step three is really how to um, layer on other diuretics for total nephron blockade. And this is a guide on how to layer on these adjunctive therapies based on the metabolic and hemodynamic profile of the patients. And so those were our clinical milestones. So what have we done from an educational perspective? So in the first year, um, I'm happy to say we welcomed nephrology fellows onto our service in February of 2021. Um, shortly after that, the cardiology services came to us and said that their fellows were interested in, in learning from us and being on the service. And so these cardiology fellows started rotating on our service last summer. And then actually this summer, we will welcome internal medicine residents onto the service. A few of them will be doing electives with us as well. We've introduced a cardio renal lecture series as part of the Monday morning fellow didactics um, where Nay and David and I have all given lectures. We've also developed core educational topics which are addressed during the rotations that any trainees do with us. And they're listed here. I'm gonna go a little fast in the interest of time. And so those were the clinical milestones, the educational milestones, and what have we done from a research perspective? So from a research perspective, the goal is really to um, use the clinical questions that come up on the service to drive our research questions, to use the service as a basis to build multidisciplinary investigative teams, and to recruit patients directly into research studies. And so I'm pleased to say that we've had a good year in terms of launching some of these initiatives. We have one NIH study, which we've called the KIND HF study, Kidney Injury and Decompensated Heart Failure Study, which is a, um, a, a, a five-year grant that looks to identify urine kidney injury markers that can guide diuretic and heart failure management in the short term while patients are hospitalized, as well as look at the long-term kidney and cardiovascular outcomes. For this study, we're recruiting patients at all, um, all at three sites within UW, but the majority of them to date have been at the Montlake service, largely in conjunction with the Kidney Heart Service. And this, um, and I want to give a thank Kevin O'Brien, Jim Kirkpatrick, and David Prince, who are co-investigators on this on this grant as well. Also, as part of Kind HF, this um, the study we've launched a second study, which is all also NIH funded which is focusing on bioethical issues in patients who are hospitalized with heart failure and AKI. And the goal of this study is to better understand the complex ethical challenges in the care of patients with who have both heart failure and advanced AKI to create tools for patient-centered decision-making. And the kind of basis for this is that we know that all these technological advances are available to patients, but is this the right decision for each patient? So to conduct this study, we're doing both um, surveys and qualitative interviews of patients who are hospitalized. And I want to thank um, Anne O'Hare, Kate Butler, and Gwen Bernacki, who's a cardiologist and palliative care physician, who've really taken the lead on this study. And finally, we have a third study that we've launched, um, and this is really focused on imaging in patients with heart failure and AKI. And so we've asked the questions, are there bedside tools, um, namely POCUS, point of care ultrasound, um, that correspond to congestion and AKI in patients who have heart failure? And so for this study, we're doing um, both serial lung ultrasounds in patients who are hospitalized with heart failure and AKI, as well as we're doing serial venous excess exams, which are called vexus ultrasounds, which is a Doppler ultrasound, which looks at um, multiple vessels, including the IVC, the portal vein, the hepatic vein, and the renal vein, and comes up with a composite congestion score. And to see how that corresponds with AKI and how that changes in response to decongestion. And we're validating these, um, these ultrasounds with gold standard right heart catheterizations. And to do this study, we're working with Amy Morris, Alan Perfikowski, Sarah Niv Ra Nick Raven, and Matt Smith um, to perform these ultrasounds and to do this work. And so I just want to highlight, you know, this, this study, which actually com is composed of three studies now, 
has really brought together nephrology, cardiology, imaging experts, critical care, bioethics, palliative care, anesthesia, and biostatistics to conduct this work. So really moving towards this goal of team science to drive innovation. And so I've shared our, what we've done so far in this first year and a half or so. So what are our plans for year two and beyond? So from an education perspective, David Mariuma is working on developing a POCUS curriculum. Um, we continue to expand our training opportunities to trainees across the educational spectrum. We're working on several clinical and other clinical innovation um, projects right now. Um, we've begun talking about what's the best way to provide dialysis in these patients who have VADs and working a little bit with Matt and some other people in the division. Um, we're working on developing more hospital protocols for SGLT2 inhibitor use. In terms of scholarship, Nayan Aurora is leading a study on hypertonic saline and decongestion, and one of the cardiologists is working with us on a project related to impellas and risk of AKI. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've convinced you that cardionephrology subspecialty services such as the UW Kidney Heart Service can advance clinical care, education, and scholarship, and hopefully lead to innovations in the field of, of nephrology. And I'd like to give a huge thank you, um, one, to Stuart and Ashley for having the vision for the service and inviting me to participate in this, and an um, extra big thank you to Nayan and David for making this happen and for launching the service. Um, and I'd like to also thank the NIH for funding the work that's gone into the service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisha. Uh, and finished on time despite my late start for you. Uh, I time, went a little fast, sorry about that. Time for questions uh, for, for Nisha. And just while people are thinking, just to uh, note some positive comments in the chat from Kathy and Suzanne about uh, everything that you're doing. Oh, thank you. Maybe I'll ask one question, Nisha. So if you had, if you and David and Nan had to point to sort of one thing that you guys are doing as part of the service that you think has most contributed to the lower length of stay, for example, do you think it's that uh, intensive stepwise diuretic algorithm? Is it something else? Is it the just sort of interdisciplinary communication? Like, what do you, what do you think? I'll give my thoughts and I'm happy to have David and Ian jump in as well. I really think the diuretic protocol has made a huge difference. You know, um, diuretic resistance and inadequate diuretic response is one of the most frustrating things about a hospitalization and really delays um, appropriate congestion. Uh, so that's my opinion. Um, David and Nan, definitely, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah, I, I would say I think the diuretic protocol plays a big role. I think talking with the teams um, and kind of having good relationships with all the different cardiologists is also very helpful. Um, I think establishing kind of dispo plans is uh, more streamlined in that way where we can say, okay, uh, this is how much torsamide we're going to use. This is how much uh, these are the thresholds we'll use to, to titrate it. Um, it, it just kind of adds, a, I think, a feeling of safety that we have a plan of what, what to do um, when they're leaving. I think that might help a little bit with, uh, with their dispo. Yeah, I think in addition to all of that, the other uh, thing that's been helpful is we know there's been a Kind of a pendulum shift in the way we think about creatinines and heart failure and, and allowing creatinines to rise and not um, reacting to those as much and being more accepting of, of higher creatinine levels understanding that there's actually a prognostic benefit many times in the context of decongestion and then additionally having the ability to follow these folks as outpatients um, i think puts a lot of people at ease and allows us to discharge them sooner than they, they might have otherwise Any other questions? I think it would be good, Nisha and David and, and Nan, uh, for us at Harborview to learn a little bit more um, and actually get that protocol because we do take care of patients here also with 
uh, heart failure more than perhaps we you might expect. And so I think it might be helpful uh, to achieve a similar uh, care plan across sites too. Absolutely, we're our, we can email it out. We've actually published the protocol now. Um, and so we've been getting questions from sites across the country about using it too. So we'd love to see it expand. All right, uh, well, thanks to uh, our speakers today, three excellent talks and robust discussion. And um, with that, we'll close. Hope everyone has a great weekend uh, and see you all next week.